so welcome everyone uh, to the workshop visualization in environmental sciences uh, i am shomodatto i am one of the coaches for this year um, so as we all know that research in environmental sciences has become increasingly important and this is because uh, environmental data research uh, impacts a lot of events such as climate change uh, extreme weather events forest fires water scarcity etc and of course we are living in the age of big data where the simulation scale and the data size is increasing rapidly and soon we are going to have capability of exascale computing and these different types of environmental simulation data sets are coming from multiple sources they have different types different qualities and resolutions and as a result uh, as we can see that visualization of this large scale data sets is an essential component to have understanding and interpretation of the different environmental phenomena that this simulation model and this also helps in decision making about those events and in general uh, helping to engage public in environmental topics so in this workshop we try to raise awareness to the importance of visualization and data analysis in the environmental sciences discipline and this workshop also serves as a forum for interdisciplinary discussions about various topics related to environmental sciences so uh, i thank all of you for joining in today uh, in this workshop and i would also like to take this opportunity to thank all our presenters and the authors uh, for the papers and i'm also thanking the steering committee who are guiding us to have a successful workshop and the organizers of eurovis definitely uh, for their hard work and helping us to put together everything and finally i'd like to also thank the program committee members and all the reviewers for helping us to put up uh, nice papers for this year and i'm also taking this opportunity to let everyone know that the computers and graphics journal is having a special issue on visualization in environmental sciences so if you have related work please consider submitting to this issue and the deadline for this is july 30 uh with that now let us move on to our technical session uh so our first speaker today is tj yankun kelly and the title of the paper is gpu assisted visual analysis of flood ensemble interaction hello i'm dr tj yankun kelly and i'll be presenting work done by my student donald johnson as part of his dissertation effort flooding is one of the most frequently occurring natural disasters flood modeling is one tool used to mitigate their effects These models can be used to predict how flood control projects would influence both historical and future floods. However, as the number of possible mitigation scenarios increases, the number of model outputs increases exponentially. Data about floods come from two major sources: imagery data from satellites and drones, or simulation data from flood models. When comparing flood models against each other, it's important to note our goal We are not interested in depth values or other information, only the existence or absence of flooding and where the various samples agree and disagree. For example, we can see these three agree, but these two disagree here. This is different from other ensemble visualization problems. Extant GIS software will hide layers due to occlusion or make it hard to read by transparency. If we just put different surfaces on top of each other, eventually the underlying surfaces will be occluded. 
Previous work in multiple surface visualization isn't appropriate as it's solving a different problem. It is looking at how different attributes combine at a single location. We don't want to see all the surfaces, just how and where they agree. We can use a CPU to investigate all these images, but ideally we want something in parallel to make it dynamic. Because as we add more and more images, there are more and more combinations. We want to avoid this combinatorial explosion. Our approach uses an overview plus detail interface to depict the strength of flood surface overlap and allow the exploration of each individual subject, subset of those interactions in detail. This exploration is enabled by a set of OpenCL kernels, which efficiently accumulate surface agreement over the images in parallel. The processing is order independent, avoiding the occlusion problem of layering approaches. In addition, the processing is spatially partitionable as our solution does not have any special dependency within a single image. Here we can see our system interface in its overview mode. The center rendering context uses a blue saturation ramp to indicate how many surfaces overlap at a location. White indicates the presence of only one surface, a flood from an observation or simulation, whereas deep blue indicates several surfaces. The side provides a list of all the flooded location surfaces and allows them to be added or removed from consideration. The other parts of the visualization will update dynamically. Finally, at the bottom, we have the distribution of the surfaces over each level of overlap. The leftmost bar indicates regions where only one surface exists, while the rightmost shows pixels with the maximum level of overlap. By clicking on these, we can enter the detail exploration mode in detail mode, the selected histogram bin is split into regions, indicating the possible subset of interaction. In this example, there are four such subsets. The split is proportional to the coverage of each subset. The membership of each subset can be identified in our overlap matrix, which maps a unique categorical color to each subset. This color is used in the rendering context to show the spatial extent of each subset to be explored. If further analysis or dissemination is needed, the images can also be exported as GeoTIFFs. Our interface is enabled by two sets of OpenCL kernels to process the data surfaces using GPU parallel processing. All data sets have been pre-registered and projected and loaded as binary images of the same size by the CPU beforehand. The first set of kernels determines how many surfaces overlap at each pixel location. We call this the value buffer. The second set of kernels to determine how many different subsets are active for each overlapping level, the mask buffer. These kernels are only executed when the set of inputs change, not when the pan or zooming of the rendering context is modified. We calculate at the data's resolution, not the screen's. For the overview kernels, the first thing we do is clear the previous accumulation buffer. Then, for each image, we increment the corresponding pixels in the accumulation buffer for each occurrence in the flood scene. This is done in parallel on the GPU. This is repeated for each subsequent image. Our kernel event scheduler is structured such that the next data is being loaded in the buffer for the previous image, while the current image is being processed in order to increase throughput. After all of the images have been accumulated, we generate a buffer that counts how many pixels were part of the same level of overlap. This is stored in the counting buffer used by the histogram display. The detail kernel works similarly to the overview kernels, but instead accumulate which surfaces occur at each pixel, given an overlap level. First, we mask the pixels belonging to the selected overlap level using the previously generated value accumulation buffer. Then, each surface is given a unique binary max that is accumulated over each pass. At the end, this, each subset is identified by a separate binary ID and assigned a unique categorical color for display. A desaturated value of the original buffer is presented for context. In addition, another counting buffer determines the relative frequency of each subset, and it is populated for use by the selected histogram bin. To test the performance of our system, we ran several scalability tests. By repeating processing of the same surface, we were able to test surface counts by a factor of 10, 10, 100, and so on. We found that the performance to be linear in the number of surfaces as shown here. 
For 10 surfaces, processing takes about 35 milliseconds, increasing to 33 seconds at 10,000 images. We also tested our processing at 2K, 4K, and 8K image sizes, and saw a similar linear performance. The size of the images that have been processed is limited by that of OpenCL memories, though, due to lack of spatial dependence, images can be partitioned into parts and processed independently, if needed. Finally, our approach uses limited memory. The system uses two data transfer buffers, two data image buffers, three accumulation buffers, and two display images. In conjunction with the small counting buffer, this accounted for about 625 megabytes of memory for our 4K squared sized images. The largest limitation on our approach is the fact that we use 16-bit unsigned integers for our buffers. This limits us to a maximum of 15 overlapping sets when counting interactions. To allow more interactions would require a larger integer size and thus an increased memory use. In our first example, we examined data from the Yazoo backwater, a flood management region west of where I live. The inputs for the study came from three groups, historic median annual 14-day duration floods from different time periods, a series of frequency flood simulations showing events with decreasing frequency of occurrence, and simulation data recreating the effects of the 2008 Mississippi River flood on the Yazoo backwater area. First, let us consider the region of the northern part of the backwater. Starting with only the 25-year flood event, seen in green, we see it mostly contained in this region. As we add more frequent events, 10-year, 5-year, and 2-year, the green indicates that these were only flood events in that region, only consisting of those overlapping events. Since none of the 14-day floods interacted with these surfaces, that means these regions do not flood for more than two weeks at a time. We can also see the effects of human intervention in the area. The green area in the center of the backwater belongs to floods occurring before 1958. Twelve surfaces overlap in this area. However, none of those surfaces participate after 1958. Instead, those are found in the south in orange. This change is due to a water channel, seen in pink, constructed in 1958 to divert that water southwards. An expert can clearly identify the effect of the structure from the visualization. Our approach also works on remotely sensed data. Here we visualize seven yearly observations of the Bayou Meto, a waterfowl management area. In the first image, we see multiple non-overlapping regions of different colors. This is the effect of farmers flooding their fields in different, non-coordinated areas over the sampled time span. It effectively looks random. Areas of significant, but not total, overlap indicate two wildlife man management areas in the center and a wetlands region in the upper right. Finally, areas that appear in every year's observation clearly indicate the path of the Arkansas River and some cutoff lakes that are more permanent features. In this talk, we presented a system for flood surface similarity exploration. It uses an overview plus detail interface that shows the distribution of similarity of overlaps over each pixel and allows drilling down into specific sets of overlaps for individual identification of subsets. The system is interactive due to a set of OpenCL kernels that utilizes the GPU's parallelism to accumulate data on each pixel in tandem. Feedback from our flood model experts was positive, with several mentioning how the system reduced their workflow from hours to seconds, or at least to be interactive. Finally, though our system was designed with flood modeling in mind, it can be adapted to general ensemble exploration where agreement and disagreement between members is the goal. Our preliminary work in this area has been promising. And that's our talk. I'd like to thank the Vicksburg area U.S. Army Corps of Engineer experts who gave us the motivation for this project, provided the data sets, and kindly provided us time to look at our interface. I'd also like to thank those who are listed here that helped us get images and icons for the presentation. Okay. Thank you again. And if you want more details, please consult the paper okay. or contact me at tjk at acm.org. Okay, uh, excellent talk. Uh, thank you.
So uh, while I'm waiting for questions, so I have one question that I can start with. So you said about the memory issue as one of your limitation in your talk. So do you think, uh, or, or are you using multiple GPUs or do you think if you use multiple GPUs, then you could possibly you know, solve that and maybe even have bigger data? Uh, so right now, the primary limitation is going to be, from my understanding, is going to be the number of interacting surfaces that we can have on top of them, uh, primarily from the masking buffer operation, because we're assigning each one of those a uh, binary identifier, so zero, mm -hmm. zero, one, blah, blah, blah. And you know, the, the number of combinations that we can have is going to grow based upon that. So while we could add more GPUs per se, I mean, it's still not going to change the number of interactions that we can represent in the masked buffer. Um, using the approach that we have currently, the only way we could scale that up is to you know, use a uh, larger unsigned integer uh, mask for that purpose. I see. We haven't done any tests on that to see how much memory that's going to take, uh, but it's you know something that could be looked into. I see. And um, and another quick question. Um, so, uh, what software did you use to build the user interface? Uh, the software was used on uh, an older version of Qt, if I remember correctly. It was developed on Windows, but my uh, student was more familiar with Qt from his okay. Linux days. So that's what he was using. Okay. All right. Okay. So if there are no further questions, um, let us thank the speaker. Uh, excellent talk. And uh, let us move on to the, our next presentation. Okay, so let us go to our second talk. Uh, the speaker is Subhashi Sajarika, and the title of the paper is Probabilistic Principal Component Analysis Guided Spatial Partitioning of Multivariate Ocean biogeochemistry data. So Shubhasis, please go ahead. Hello everyone. Welcome to our talk about probabilistic principal component analysis guided spatial partitioning of multivariate ocean biogeochemistry data. So I'm going to make this presentation. My name is Subhashi Hazarika. My co-authors are Ayan Vishwas, Earl Lawrence, and Philip Wolfram. We are all from the Los Alamos National Laboratory in New Mexico, USA. So let me get started with the motivation of this work. So in this work, our target application is a multivariate ocean biogeochemistry or BGC simulation data. So this comprises of uh, measurements or concentrations of essential nutrients like nitrite, iron, and various organic and inorganic compounds found in ocean and which are conducive for the growth of macroalgae or seaweeds. And as you know, seaweeds or macroalgae are one of the most important sources of biofuel. Right? So it's important to study the relationship of these nutrients and how they can contribute towards having successful macroalgae cultivation. However, the challenge, there are multiple challenges associated with multivariate data analysis and visualization in general. Uh, first of all, uh, the high dimensional nature of the data makes the problem non-trivial. And also different locations across the spatial domain of the ocean can exhibit different variable relationship. Right? So it's not easy to model this complex non-linear multivariate relationship across this high resolution spatial domain. So in this work, we propose a solution which decomposes the spatial domain based on how the local vari variable relationships are distributed across the space. Right? The idea is that this is going to help model this global complex nonlinear relationship by using multiple simple locally linear analysis models. And this will help and facilitate and perform analysis and multivariate tasks in a much scalable manner instead of doing it on the entire field. 
Our proposed solution is to have a probabilistic formulation of principal component analysis which we call PPCA and combine it with a popular uh, image segmentation or image clustering kind of an approach which is called SLIC or simple linear iterative clustering and we use this to, to propose our new variable relationship based special partitioning scheme. Uh, let me give you a high level idea of the concept of probabilistic principal component analysis first. So the late, uh, so here is a graphical model of PPCA, the latent variable model. Uh, PPCA is essentially uh, framed uh, to understand the probabilistic formulation of principal component analysis. Uh, we have to look at it in terms of factor analysis representation of PC. So here in this equation, x is this high dimensional d dimensional vector and z is the low dimensional representation w is the transformation matrix that we use here and mu is the mean of this field and epsilon is the error associated with the reconstruction from the low dimensional to the high dimensional uh, field over here so in this graphical model what you see is that we can treat this original high dimensional resolution x as a random variable and the reduced dimension g as another random variable and we have all these parameters that we want to model right? so to keep it simple at high level uh, ppc or probabilistic formulation of pc assumes that this random variable g is normally distributed with identity uh, covariance matrix uh, so does this error matrix which have a standard deviation of uh, sigma square and i which is the sigma square standard deviation and as a result the distribution of x given z which means the uh, high dimensional uh, uh, vector given this low dimensional representation is also a normal distribution by this equation over here right? so uh, formulating these random variables in terms of gaussian distributions helps us to achieve and have a lot of features that will be helpful the most important feature that we are planning to use in this work is the ability to calculate log likelihood of a principal component analysis model right so ignoring the technicalities of this equation uh, what it tells is that ppca have this feature where we can compute the likelihood of a new point belonging to a, a computed or already designed model or pr uh, principal component analysis model right with this equation over here so in this diagram what you can this explains this concept here so if you have this gray points uh, multivariate points you design a principal component analysis p1 pc1 and pc2 are the axis of this principal uh, component analysis model now you have this bunch of new red points coming over so what ppca allows you is that you can now calculate the likelihood of these points uh, being modeled by the principal component over these points right so we can query how likely will a new point be modeled by the already existing principal component analysis model so this is a very interesting feature and we use this in our uh, partitioning algorithm mm. so now let's move on to the actual meat of the algorithm which is the simple linear iterative clustering algorithm or slick it's a popular super pixeling algorithm in uh, image classification and image clustering domain and it was published in 2012 and it basically uh, finds irregular partitions in the image with homogeneous pixel values right so it's it looks at the features and automatically kind of guides to regions where they have similar uh, pixel values right so this we utilize it for scientific data to come up with partitions where we have similar or a simpler multivariate relationship or a linear relationship so here is our proposed high level overview of our proposed approach of combining ppca with slick to achieve a special partitioning scheme Right. So our algorithm at a high level uh, starts off by having a regular partition of the space and then we pick up a single partition space and compute using the multivariate data we compute the local uh, PPC or a probabilistic principal component model right, for each of this partition. So consider this center partition over here. We now look over a bigger neighborhood around this partition right, and then for each point within this bigger neighborhood highlighted in blue over here we try to see what is the likelihood of a point over here uh, to be modeled by the pc of this model here right if this likelihood value is higher than the likelihood of this point being modeled by its own uh, partition that it belongs to 
then we actually assign the allocation of this point to this particular partition over here right and we repeat this over and over for multiple iterations and then what we end up is an irregular shape partition the property of this partitions is such that the multivariate data within each partition or the data points within each partition can be better modeled by a PCA, the local PCA model over there. Right? So it captures the linear relationship among the multivariate relation, multivariate data points within that partition. Okay? So that's the high level overview. You can refer to our paper for the detailed explanation of the different steps. <coughs> uh, we performed a quite a bit of extensive evaluation and compared it with the other possible different approaches. We compared with three different partitioning schemes to see how or where do we stand. Right? The first uh, scheme P1 is a very naive regular block wise non overlapping partition sizes where we have this uh, 35, 75 dimensional variable space and then we just uh, pick up a fixed block size and then we partition it. Uh, irrespective of the data property right so this is the most naive form of partitioning approach the second one is slightly more intelligent it's using kd tree based partitioning where the idea is to perform access aligned cuts as shown here in this animation and we keep cutting till a certain condition or uh, criteria is satisfied kd tree is quite popular with univariate data but for our case, since we want to compare with a multivariate scheme, we uh, modified it slightly to make sure that we have a comparable metric along with our proposed approach. In this case, we started performing this excess aligned cuts uh, by first computing the local PC of a given partition. Then we had this criteria where we checked that if say a small amount of q number of principal components can capture can capture 99% explained variance of the multi underlying multivariate data we stop partitioning or stop splitting that uh, local partition otherwise if that condition is not met we keep partitioning till we meet that criteria or we have reached kind of a threshold partition size that we desire so this is our kd tree based kind of an approach p2 which we compare our uh, proposed algorithm partitioning algorithm with the third one is called super pca so it's based on a work published in 2018 on hyperspectral imagery so it worked with uh, multiple spectral image but we thought this is very similar to what the problem we're trying to solve of multivariate data so we tried to apply this hyperspectral imagery uh, algorithm on our multivariate data set as well the high level idea of this uh, super pca is that you perform a global pc of the entire space of the high resolution data not of a small location and then you pick up the field corresponding to the first principal component which essentially captures the maximum explained variance in the data we then perform this regular slick algorithm only on this first principal component field and we come up with some irregular partitions so this was the approach uh, uh, suggested in this paper and we tried to compare our result with this approach as well and using the first principal component one point to note here is that we feel that this may not be valid to diverse multivariate data because the first principal component in this case we realized was not able to capture uh, a good amount of explained variance it was around 50 percent of it right? so the results may not be optimal in that sense if we're talking about multivariate property for individual partitions anyway we had this three partitioning schemes and we have Two different criteria on which we will judge how good uh, multivariate partitioning scheme is uh, first one c1 is that criteria is to how much explained variance can be captured by less number of uh, principal components and the other one is uh, uh, how the quality of multivariate reconstruction with less number of principal components so let's start with the first one here first the idea here is that we want to see how many principal components can capture say 99 percent variance of the multivariate data in each of the individual partitions and the judging criteria is that fewer the number of principal components the better it is okay. so the top row shows the results for the three different partitioning schemes that we compare against the bottom one is our proposed approach as you can see in our result most of them are purple or light purple or deep purple which corresponds to 11 and 10 in this categorical heat map 
So this basically shows for each partition if we perform PCA, local PCA, and we see how much, how many components do we need to capture 99% variance of the 70 original 75 variable data set. That's the number being visualized over here. You can see most of the regions are this uh, deep purple or light purple, which is corresponding to 10 or 11 components, which means that only 10 or 11 components are good enough to capture 99% explained variance of a 75 variable data set. Right? So if we store that, we are good to go and like reconstruct and do analysis, multivariate analysis with just 11 or 10 components. Right? But the quality that you see with the rest of the three is that we have a lot of red regions which corresponds to around 13, right? So obviously our partitioning scheme based on probabilistic principal component analysis is able to identify those regions which will require eventually less amount of variables or dimensions to be stored to perform multivariate analysis, right? And uh, you can refer to the paper for detailed uh, values and evaluations on this criteria over here. The second criteria is built on this first criteria itself. Uh, we want to reconstruct the full 75 variables from each of these minimum components that we have at each partition. Okay? And we want to see how good the quality of reconstruction is. Here is the reconstructed field for one of these uh, fields out of 75. As you can see, the top three, which shows these three partitioning schemes, have artifacts developed because of the partitioning size, right? So obviously the first one is not data driven, so you have the squared blocks. Even in the KD tree, we have uh, artifacts around here showing the partition boundaries. The same goes for us. It's, slight, it's much better, but slightly we still see some partitioning effects, artifacts over here. But our uh, proposed approach actually does much better than these three approaches, right? Because we have, we are using a multivariate property driven partitioning scheme, right? So as you can see visually or uh, qualitatively, we don't see much of an artifact over here in our reconstruction phase. And uh, quantitatively, we try to look at the average root mean square across all the variables and we realize our proposed approach actually has a much less reconstruction error in this here and you can refer to our paper for detail about this study and what insights we got out of this okay, okay uh, to show the application of this multivariate partitioning scheme we had a case study where we talked with the domain experts to understand the relationship of uh, the essential nutrients nitrite and iron concentration and how they are related to different how they are related across different regions of this ocean space because they are directly related to how conducive the growth environments are for macroalgae cut, uh, cultivation okay. so in the left two you see the original high resolution fields for iron and nitrate concentrations and in the right what you see is that for those individual identified partitions that we have found with our approach partitioning approach we computed the linear correlation coefficient the pearson's correlation coefficient between these two variables and we can do that because we have now uh, broken or decomposed this space into small partitions where a linear model is good to understand or perform analysis right instead of performing a full non-linear and complex relationship we have decomposed this into small local blocks and from this analysis it's uh, we can always we can identify regions where uh, this relationship is positive or negative and what are those places where there is nutrient limitation or that can cause that may not cause a good cultivation of macroalgae right you can refer to the paper for uh, further evaluations on this work and yeah so this is kind of is a is a proof of concept that this approach can help you perform complex multivariate relationship using simpler and much more popular models like correlation analysis and on local regions to get a much better estimate of how things are across the space. Uh, to conclude, in this work, uh, we have proposed a new special partitioning scheme based on variable relationship of multivariate uh, scientific data. And the idea is that this is going to help uh, study complex nonlinear relationship across the entire high resolution spaces by breaking down into smaller, simpler, locally linear special models. In future, we want to actually improve the computational time, which is slightly higher than the super PC or other very naive partitioning schemes. We'll see if there are possibilities of parallelizing and increasing the computational type of partitioning. We also want to apply it as an in situ data reduction solution for multivariate data. Since we are uh, working on a PCA based model, 
which is actually which helps dimension to reduction we can probably bring down the uh, variable dimensions quite a bit if we use this kind of a partitioning approach uh, we also want to apply it on time varying data on simulation mm -hmm. data sets uh, to understand whether we need to update the partitioning scheme at a different time point or not during the simulation execution uh, timeline mm. Last but not the least, I would like to acknowledge the following funding sources from Los Alamos National Lab and across DOE. And thank you everyone for listening to my talk and I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you. Okay, uh, excellent talk. Uh, thank you Shubhashish for the nice presentation of your paper. So, uh, so let us wait a little bit for questions and in the meantime, maybe I can ask a few questions. So uh, can you explain a little bit about why you need the probabilistic version of this algorithm and where that probabilistic part of that algorithm is helping you, which regular PCA cannot do? Yeah, right. Uh, I think that's a very valid point, and that's where actually the advantage of using this in this kind of an in the middle of this uh, clustering algorithm it kind of uh, shows up. Uh, if you look at the deterministic version of PCA, we do an eigen decomposition and we get a metric which just converts a given data point uh, to a PCA space, and then we we know how like the all the properties that PCA has, right? But uh, the probabilistic formulation is the same stuff but it looks at the same modeling ex experiences or modeling of the data but in a in a more distribution sense right so the clear-cut advantage out here that we are utilizing in this work is that say you have a bunch of 100 data points you create a pca model now you have new 10 data points right so do you want to see how these 10 data points are they good enough to be modeled by the pca model that you have right does does it fit into the data or do you need a separate model for this new bunch of points right and probabilistic PCA has been extensively used for mixture of PCA models to model bigger and linear mo non-linear models. Here we just utilize the fact that this uh, computation of likelihood value is useful and we kind of applied it in conjunction with a sleek kind of an approach to utilize it for like better structuring of data. So to answer your question, I think the likelihood value is used as a tool to kind of drive uh, the partition shapes and sizes that we have okay okay um okay one more question is um uh what is the computational complexity of this compared to the regular pca and how big your data set is at this point like since you are talking about applying this in the future for really large data maybe in situ mm -hmm. so computation wise is is it more expensive than uh, if you just yeah i think uh, that will be a very key factor if we kind of uh, apply it for simulations or in situ even like for temporal data spaces talking of uh, complexity of uh, probabilistic pca it's it's very it's it's not that much it's very fast it's basically if you just look down at it's a gaussian model right it's just basically looking at the likelihood of a closed form gaussian distribution so uh, the eventual calculation of uh, pro, uh, the likelihood values or even the probability values is not going to be exactly high. I feel the main problem is where the sleek algorithm is an iterative clustering approach, right? So how do we uh, like have ways where we can say we terminate at a point, we don't go too far, or or how do we do it in a distributed environment? Those are the challenges that we'll have. Probably we can have like more amount of data residing in each processor, like host data, host layers of nearby cells do that. But calculation wise, I think uh, the most con time consuming part is this iterative part, right? How much do you keep optimizing? There are a lot of hyperparameters with sleek approaches and to know which one would be a good one for a particular data set is challenging. And that's what we are trying to see. Like, can we have something which is more feasible for a in-situ simulation or for big distributed data? Okay, okay. Um, and maybe one more question is so uh, i i'm assuming this is for data reduction i mean even though uh, you touched upon it towards the end of your talk so uh, like did you do any kind of study like how much reduction can you get out of this 
Uh, yeah, so this has like uh, here we presented it in the form that we are modeling this big nonlinear spatial relationship in piecewise kind of forms, right? Piecewise linear forms. So since we are building on top of PCA, which is popularly also used for data reduction, right? And that's a very like uh, very obvious kind of uh, use case of it. We tried it on like uh, we tried to combine this variable reduction with spatial sampling as well. And in terms of variable reduction that PC offers, it will be uh, with those metrics that I showed. We have uh, more results in the paper. It's basically say I told out of 75 variables, you just need to store 10 to capture 99.9% .9 explained variance, which means you don't have to store 75 variables to do your multivariate analysis. You just have this uh, 10 dimensions, which if you convert back or reconstruct back, you can do the same analysis in the post hoc manner, right? So yeah, so that is kind of as an empirical number that I can give you like around 10, 13 versus 75, uh, that is 99. And if your uh, analysis doesn't demand much of a multivariate analysis, then you can always go down to even five or three variables that captures that, right? And it's different for different spatial regions. So yeah, so that is a clear cut advantage of using PCA for this purpose. And then on top of this variable reduction, you can also reduce the spatial by all the like spatial compression or data reduction techniques that we have for spatial data. Okay. Okay. So I don't have any more questions. And if there are no further questions, so let us move on to our third talk and let's thank Subhashish again for the nice talk. Thank you. All right, so we have two talks done already. We have two more to go in this session. So let's welcome our third speaker, Anke Fredereshi. And the title of the paper is A Winding Angle Framework for Tracking and Exploring AD Transport in Oceanic Ensemble Simulations. Anke, please go ahead. Hello, everybody. In this talk, we'll be looking at an ensemble simulation of the Red Sea, specifically to quantify and analyze the transport of oceanic eddies using winding angle method. I am Anke Federici, and this is joint work with Martin Falk and Ingrid Hotz. But first, let us have a look at the setting. The Red Sea is quite narrow and shallow, with Africa on the one coast and the Arabian Peninsula on the other. The feature we are interested in are mesoscale ocean eddies. An eddy is a circular surface vortex, here most important for its horizontal transport, since in such a narrow sea an eddy can quickly reach from one coast to the other. In general though, they are also rather important for their vertical mixing properties, since they either draw up nutrient-rich cold water from the bottom, or they drag down surface, surface water, which is warmer and high in oxygen. The questions we're asking are first, what exactly do these boundaries look like in the Red Sea? Secondly, how are they distributed? And finally, how do they transport salt and heat? This is an extension to our submission to the IEEE CIVIS contest 2020. The data was simulated by the group of Ibrahim Hotaid from the Karlst University, which is on one of those coasts. The data is freely available online and it is an ensemble simulation. So we do not only have 60 time steps for this 3D volume, but also 50 ensemble members. So we have quite a lot of data that we have to comb through. Our approach roughly goes like this. First, we extract eddy volumes across both time and the members. From them, we gather some statistics about both their geometry and the values that they transport. These statistics are then visualized in an interactive visualization setting where we can both evaluate them and compare eddies and ensemble members against each other. But first, let us look at a few observations. Since the Red Sea is this narrow, the eddies are quite irregularly shaped. So we will want the full boundary and not just a circular representation as we could, for example, do in the open ocean. More general, an eddy translates much slower than it rotates, 
that basically means that the movement of an eddy is much slower than its rotation as it moves along. This means that streamlines here are very well suited to approximate path lines and we can in general rely on Eulerian methods and don't have to go Lagrangian, which would be much more expensive. Looking from a side view, we can also see another common property of ocean flow, and that is that the vertical component is insignificant, so it is two to three orders of magnitude lower than the horizontal transport. So to simplify things, we can build a volume from horizontal slices, so basically looking at 2D problems one at a time and then combining them. To find eddy boundaries, here are a few related works. There's of course local methods that threshold some property. Here, for example, the sea level. As we said, eddies either well up or drag down water, which we can see in the sea surface height. This, of course, only works on the surface. Another one that is commonly used is the Okubu Weiss criterion, where we basically compare the rotation against the shear in each point and mark everything where the rotation is relatively higher than the shear value. But we can already see the problem here. So up there we see all the areas that this criterion gives us and there's a lot of clutter here. So we cannot expect all of these to be eddies. Looking at Eulerian topology, we can see that the feature we'd most like to have are closed streamlines. Since in a non-time dependent setting, a streamline cannot escape one of these closed streamlines. So there would be a perfect eddy in a snapshot. To relax this a bit to real data, the winding angle method was introduced. Here, we basically only want a streamline to close on itself almost. So they should fulfill a circle, which we can measure in the angles, and the endpoints should be quite close to each other. This is the method we'll be using, since it is quite simple and efficient. As said before, Lagrangian methods would better represent the actual behavior of the eddies in this timely method, but they're quite expensive to compute. So let us go through our pipeline. First, we use the winding angle criterion. For this, we integrate a lot of streamlines and keep all of those that fulfill a full angle, so either 2 pi or negative 2 pi in the sum of all angles inscribed. Then we first filter them by the endpoint distance, so we take out spirals and the likes. We also expect them to be quite round, so we do not get something that is very far away from a circle. We then cluster these by center points. On the left here, you can see some of the parameters we can select to change this filtering and clustering. This is now repeated for all depth slices and for each time step. So we basically get 4D data across depth and time. We cluster them again by their center distance and get these stacks of boundary candidates. In this step, we also filter out all non-surface vortices as those are not typical eddies. From these boundary candidates, we now need to create surfaces. For this, we select an optimal boundary in each slice. For this, we prefer a line that is first enclosing a large eddy, secondly, rather round, and finally, rather similar to its neighbor slices, so we don't get a very wavy look on the outside, but a nice, smooth eddy surface. We can then use these surfaces to gather statistics about each eddy. First, the geometric ones, so for example, their depth, the radius, or the rotation direction. But we can also intersect it with the scalar values we have. In this case, this is an intersection with the temperature scalar and gather transport statistics about this. We repeat this for each ensemble member and then combine this in interactive visualizations. The first such visualization we present is for comparing members against each other and to compare single eddies. We have first this 3D geometric view and also the scatter plot, where each eddy is represented by a point. We get all information through hovering or can click them to have it linked in both the geometry view and in the time plot. 
We can also select it directly in the geometry to here select another eddy that is similar in location and in depth. And now we can compare the geometries on the top, but also the time characteristics here on the bottom. We can see that the number of voxels, so basically their size, basically goes down over time for both of them. The salinity is increasing with a few wiggles in the data, but interestingly in the first member the temperature, the average temperature, seems to first go down and then climb up again, while in the other member it first rises before leveling out. As another example, let's select these eddies in the north of the Red Sea. Down here in the parallel coordinates we can see their full statistics. We see that the lifetime differs and such the number of voxels. Here we filter out all that are not visible in the first time slice and then also those that do not reach far into the ocean. So now we only have those that are visible and down below. We can for example also only look at those that rotate in a certain direction, either clockwise or counterclockwise. In the second view we can compare several ensemble members against each other. So here we can either have a look at just one of them or bring them all in together to see the whole statistics. In the scatterplot we again see the distribution of the eddies in space and in the scatterplot matrix we can explore the correlations between the properties. For example, the lifetime is correlated to a high number of voxels, which makes sense. But there's also interesting ones such that a high lifetime and a high death into the ocean are correlated as well. One question the domain scientists were interested in is in the correlation between the temperature and the salinity, which we can see here to correlate well both as the scatter plot and through the blue values that are highlighted in the scatter plot matrix. So let us now select these semi-stable eddies that we've looked at before, but just selecting them in the scatter plot up there. We can see that all of them have quite a high lifetime, except for a few outliers, which we can just filter out here. We see that all of them have about the same average radius, and they all go very low into the ocean, which is remarkable. Their temperature and their salinity are in a very similar range. All of them are rotating counterclockwise, and thus they all have an upwelling surface level anomaly, so they are higher than the average ocean. Interestingly, we seem to have exactly one of these eddies per ensemble member, so this seems to be a very stable structure. We now wish to evaluate the eddy extraction we have performed. Since eddies are mostly defined through their mass transport, we prefer those that can keep their mass inside for a while. We can measure this mass conservation through particle advection. So what we're doing is, for each point within an eddy's boundary, we advect a particle forward and backward in time and see whether it remains inside. The blue ones are the ones that actually escape the boundary, so in this case they are rather few. Now, as to a qualitative measure, it is good as a rough estimate, but we are also aware that it is quite biased towards larger eddies, since the area of an eddy increases quadratically, whereas the boundary where particles can escape is only linear through size. With this qualitative measure, we can now evaluate the parameters and their impact on their choice. The first one we have is the endpoint distance threshold, so in the winding angle method, how far may endpoints be from each other? Increasing this value, of course, generates more eddies and allows for larger boundaries. The roundness weight, so how much we want to weigh and how round the eddy shape is, has overall little impact on all the qualitative measures on the left here. And finally, the individual shape weight, so how much we should prefer a single eddy slice to look nice compared to it being similar to its neighbors, also has little impact on these measures overall. In conclusion, we have presented a stable 4D boundary extraction for oceanic eddies, which builds on the 2D winding criterion and then clusters these 
into Freudy surfaces. We have extracted statistics about both their geometry and their transport. On top of these, we built interactive visualizations, one for eddy and member comparison and two as an ensemble overview. We have used coherence as a stability measure and with that could show that the parameter dependence is rather low. For future work, we'd like to further explore this mass coherence in other applications and maybe to unbias it in some way. It would also be interesting to cluster eddies. Like we saw, we had these really stable eddies down here, but in the Red Sea we have much more spurious patterns appearing. And finally, of course, there should be nothing holding back our algorithm to apply to different data, both in other confined waters, such as the Gulf of Mexico, and also just the open ocean, where eddies are much rounder and survive for a much longer time. Okay, thanks. So with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Our implementation is available as an external module in the InVivo open source framework. So I'm now very happy to take your questions. All right. Uh, thanks a lot, Anke, for the nice presentation. Very nice work. Uh, so, one question I have is: You are sort of using like a two D slice. You are sort of treating the data as two D slices, right, in your technique. So, um, and so, did you consider using? other vortex extraction techniques such as you know lambda to q criteria those other ways of extracting vortex regions from the data which works in 3d uh, and any comparison with those mm -hmm. yeah we tried out different extraction methods and one of them was the uh, the scalar ones where you basically compute lambda 2 or the q criterion but we found that first of all there's a lot of noise so we find a lot of regions that are very small and very noisy, so they disappear after a short time. Um, so with this one, we had much more control over the parameters. So we could actually give it to people and have them select the different sliders to change the shape a little bit, while it was also very stable. So we did not find a lot of um, false positives in the data. It also made it very simple to go by slice by slice, so we're never looking at a lot of memory at the same time. Um, yeah, so in the end, it was just one of the a very simple method that we had a lot of control over. Okay, interesting. Um, and another question is, does the scale of the eddy impacts your technique? Like if the eddy is pretty small, then does do you see like some performance issues, some errors coming up or no? Most of the measures are pretty independent of size. Like I said, the only thing that that has a problem with different sizes is the coherence measure in the end, which was basically just used to evaluate the methods. But except for that, it should be pretty independent of size. We, of course, get a problem when they are too small for us to find. So we're seeding a lot of streamlines, but we cannot sample them uh, in a very high resolution. Um, right now, we sample one like every second in every second cell of the data. If something is much smaller than that, then of course we have a hard time finding it. Um, and we're also filtering out everything that is that small because then you would not consider it an eddy. But that again is something that we mostly leave to the domain scientists that have a better idea of how large an eddy should be to be considered a real eddy. Okay, uh, so we have one question here. So I assume you, heavily super related the z dimension in your 3d view how far apart are the slices you're looking at actually have you looked into how to get an optimal distance between slices and so the coming from custom the question is coming from probably custom mm -hmm. yeah so the slices in z are actually not even uniformly distributed. So on top, they are more closely together because we are more interested uh, on the surface level and then on the bottom, they be, uh, grow larger apart. So it's not even a linear scale. But you're right, we are just uh, we're representing them uniformly. So every slice gets as much space as any other. 
um, which is basically not really correct, but it makes it easier for us to view. Also, it increases the, um, well, basically, since we are more interested in the top slices, it would be counter beneficial to that to just squeeze it together again as it is in the data. I am not sure what the slicing is. I think the top slice is around 50 meters apart, but I might be very wrong here. But like I said, it increases with the depth. Okay, I see. Um, and one more question. So, so I saw that in your interface when you are looking at the spatial visualization, so you sort of have two ensemble members comparing with each other. So do you think that could be a potential issue for like scalability? Like if you want to compare say four or five members in the spatial domain, mm -hmm. or can you extend it, you know? Yes, so that view, we presented basically two predefined visualization sets that can of course be combined. So the first one was to compare two members against each other. So when I find out there's two members that are interesting, I can show them at the same time. But I could also um, present a lot more, but then it gets a bit cluttered, right? So I guess four would still be okay. But that case was really just to compare two of them. When we have more than that, we kind of want to move away from this 3D view. The 3D view is nice if you have very few members, but after that, you want to look more at the statistics. So then we're starting to look more at 2D scatter plots, like we had where we had the, um, the scatter plot matrix next to it. So then we have more the statistics over a lot of different ensemble members, and every eddy basically collapses to a point of data. So we don't have this 3D, uh, this 3D geometry that we're looking at, because that would just be much too cluttered. Okay. All right, uh, so I don't see any more questions. So let's thank Anke again, very nice presentation. And Thanks. let us move on to our last uh, talk for this session. Okay, so our final talk for this session will be given by Felix Wraith. And the title of the paper is Uncertainty Aware Detection and Visualization of Ocean Eddies in Ensemble Flow Fields, a Case Study of the Red Sea. Felix, please go ahead. Hi, and welcome to the presentation of the Uncertainty Aware Detection and Visualization of Ocean Eddies in Ensemble Flow Fields a case study of the Red Sea. My name is Felix and I will tell you something about our motivation, idea and the basics in the first part of this talk. Following this, I will show you a case study to show our new approach. Everyone knows vertices from his household. Exactly like this, ocean vertices behave and can rotate clockwise or counterclockwise. However, the so-called eddies are much bigger and can have dimensions of several hundred kilometers. This can be found in all world oceans like the Gulf Stream and secondary seas like the Red Sea. But what makes the eddies so interesting for research? Eddies play an essential role in the transport of heat, energy and material. As a result, they can affect global ocean dynamics, weather conditions and commercial activities. Therefore, detection is an essential task to study ocean dynamics, improve local ocean forecasts and provide the Coast Guard with search and rescue operation tools. Ocean water simulations are performed to detect such eddies. For this purpose, a variety of techniques calculated whenever or not an eddy is in a particular cell of a dataset. This process introduced various uncertainties that can affect the decision process. Appropriate visualization approaches are needed to create awareness of all these uncertainties. Unfortunately, this often doesn't consider uncertainty or only one type of uncertainty. 
This is the point where syswork starts. The goal of our work is to create a framework through the detection and visualization of uncertainty. This will allow uncertainties to be incorporated into the simulation process of eddies and thus improve verification. First, we will briefly discuss eddy detection used in this work before dealing with uncertainties. In this work, we have chosen a method based in the Kubo Weiss parameter to identify eddy. It is an established method in oceanography and this criterion quantified the relative importance of deformation and rotation. The Okubo-Rice parameter is defined on the velocity field and expressed in velocity gradients resulting in the following formula. With the Okubo-Rice parameters, two regions can be found. The negative regions where verticity dominate, also called eddy cores, and the positive regions where strain dominates, also called eddy rings. Only the eddy cores are of interest to us. To detect the eddy cores, we use a corresponding Okubovice threshold. For this purpose, we normalize the Okubovice value with the standard deviation and see if it is a smaller than the threshold. Typically, minus 0.2 is used in the literature for the Okubovice threshold. However, the Okubovice parameter has a problem. It detects too many false positive eddies, which can be seen very well in this figure. Therefore, the results have been verified. For this purpose, we use the four corner method known from the literature. This verified whenever an eddy is completely rotated, an angle is calculated between each velocity vector of all eddy points and a vector oriented to the east. These angles are sorted into one of four angular ranges northeast, northwest, southwest, and southeast. Besides, each angular range must contain at least 8% of an eddy. This already reduced the eddy detection enormously, as can be seen in this figure. But here it is still not clear how uncertainty an eddy is. Therefore, we started to analyze the eddy detection to identify sources of uncertainty. However, first we have to clarify what we mean by uncertainties. The uncertainty of a measurement is a quantification of the doubts about the measurement result. It is uncertainty is known, the measurement is defined as uncertainty aware. In contrast, if this uncertainty is unknown, the measurement is uncertain. This uncertainty can arise from various effects such as an incomplete definition of the measurement or deviations in repeated observations of the measurement under apparently identical conditions. These effects can be divided into several categories. Uncertainty based on the underlying computational model is an epistemic uncertainty and aleatoric uncertainty is a statistically uncertainty resulting from variations in the measurement results when an experiment is performed multiple times. In most cases, aleatoric uncertainty is a type of uncertainty that should be visualized to improve. A decision making process in a particular application. In the context of ocean simulation, several sources of uncertainty can be identified, affecting the resulting data and the analysis. The first source of uncertainty is an aleatoric and sample uncertainty. This results from the fact that ocean simulations 
are run several times with different boundary conditions such as temperature, water volume or current conditions. This results in capturing a range of potential ocean behaviors. Unfortunately, it is not clear whenever one simulation is more trustworthy than another. Therefore, all simulation must be considered. For any calculations, this means that there may be simulations that include an eddy in a certain cell and others that don't. Another source of uncertainty is the aleatoric time uncertainty. An ocean simulation usually results in a time series that must be analyzed in different time steps. The values can be more or less accurate and the time steps have to be correlated to understand the eddies detected in different time steps. This results in time steps that can be classified as certain or uncertain. The third source of uncertainty we have identified is an epistemic threshold or parameter uncertainty. In eddy detection, ocean simulations are mathematically examined to determine whenever an eddy is presented at a particular location. Here, several parameters can set the Okubo-Weiss threshold which aims to exclude noise that leads to false detection of eddies. This threshold is chosen based on several experiments and there is a broad consensus on appropriate thresholds. Nevertheless, there is no mathematical proof of an optimal threshold. Besides these differences, all sources can be calculated using the same formula. This requires the maximum, minimum and step size of the entered parameter range and the local maximum of all cells from an eddy in the corresponding parameter range. These types of uncertainty can be checked independently by mapping to the original range. However, this could lead to a little clutter. Furthermore, we aimed for a unified measure that captured all three types of uncertainty. Therefore, we introduced a unified uncertainty. This combined all three sources of uncertainty and allow us to compare all these measures with each other and get an overall view at the same time. For this, we use a glue that gives the certainty equivalent to the uncertainty. This glue is when displayed in the domain embedded view. In this view, the eddies are represented by isosurfaces that encoded the uncertainty in their transparency. Besides, each eddy is provided with a glue indicated the distribution of the quantified uncertainty. In contrast to the domain embedded view, the uncertainty space view spends an attribute space consisting of the three sources of uncertainty. In this space, the rule domain or only a part of it maps linearity. An uncertainty cube is formed and consisting of the three uncertainty values as dimensions. In the respective cube, all uncertainties are represented as points to give a first overview of the distribution of uncertainty values in a dataset. These two views can interact with each other. To this purpose, Fiber surfaces are used, which are well suited to connect two three dimensional spaces. But how does the full thing look now in practice? Let's have a look at the freely accessible dataset of the Red Sea from the Cyrus Content 
2020. In this dataset, we first define the ranges and step sizes for the uncertainty calculation of the three uncertainty sources. In these figures, you can see our three uncertainty sources. The transparency where encoded the level of uncertainty detected in each cell of the ocean simulation with high transparency representing high uncertainty. After we were done with the preparation, we performed the edit detection with default settings known from the literature. The following close-up figures of the Gulf of Aden we had taken in which the four eddies can be seen. It is already clear to recognize over the transparency that the eddies 1 and 4 are more certain than the eddies 2 and 3. Besides, one recognized in the glyph well that eddy 3 is particularly stable over the parameter uncertainty, but over the time uncertainty very unstable. Another close-up of the Red Sea shows, in contrast to the reverse figure, we can easily see about the transparency that the eddies have high uncertainty. Here, the first close-up shows some small eddies with high uncertainty. We can see that the parameter uncertainty is very high for all these eddies compared to the other uncertainties. And such this uncertainty has rather a small influence. In the second close-up, on the other hand, it can be seen that the time uncertainty for this eddy has a high degree of uncertainty compared to the other sources of uncertainty. Now, we want to look at the interaction with the uncertainty cube. The left image shows the selection that's in the codomain. Here, we first use a plane as a region of interest. In the right figure, we look at the eddy 4 from the Gulf of Aden. Here, you can see which areas within the eddy are stable and how. In the right figure, the more stable core of the eddy is shown in orange. We map the temperature of the eddy core as an example. Since this is an important parameter for domain science. Another example shows the eddy 1. Here we select, with the help of the fiber surface, two areas within the eddy, and cube 1 shows a smaller subregion that had high ensemble uncertainty. Besides, the selected core itself has high uncertainty, and cube 2 shows high certainty all three quantified uncertainties and is located in the eddy center. This shows that the larger core of the eddy is more certain than the smaller subregion connected to it. This example shows that our interaction approach allows the user to explore the distributions of the uncertainties in the selected eddy and correlate them with the find uncertainty space. In summary, we have proposed an approach to detect and visualize ocean eddies in the sample flow fields that take uncertainty into account. We provide a quantification of each type of uncertainty. Further, we provide a visualization approach that provides a holistic view of the quantified uncertainties. and we conducted a case study on the web to test our approach. Based on this, in the future, we want to provide further approaches to quantify uncertainty for beta parameters that can be calculated for specific eddies. We want to analyze more data sets that include ocean simulations. And finally, we aim to conduct a user evaluation that examinates the performance of the interaction methodology provided. Thanks for your attention. All right.
Thank you, Felix, for the nice talk. Very nice work. Uh, so we have some questions I see in the chat. So Tim Gerritz is asking, how do you decide where to place the glyph and how do you deal with the fact that the glyphs can be much larger than the actual eddy? Yeah, um, good questions. Um, first, we, yeah, or currently we set the clues on, on place uh, above the, the eddy. Um, so from the surface, from the ocean surface, see, and um, the location is the point where the Okubo wise parameter uh, has the lowest uh, value, and we define this as center for the eddy uh, in this um, yes paper. And um, the second question was um, yeah uh, uh, yes uh, with the overlapping. Yeah, yeah. Uh, currently uh, we place the, in the frog round the glyphs, uh, but um, we have the option to hide uh, the glyphs uh, when you not see the eddy or uh, your focus is more on the position from the eddy itself. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. Uh, second question is from Anke and. The question is, your method requires that an eddy will always overlap across ensemble members. Is this correct? Especially yes, uh, it's correct. OK. And then the continuation is, especially when time progresses, there is a high uncertainty in the eddy position, though. So maybe no overlap is present. Can you handle this type of uncertainty in some way? Yeah, um, in the time uncertainty, it's correct. Um, that we uh, we have a problem uh, when the eddy um, when the position from the eddy is not uh, fixed, but um, we have also so the option to classify the eddy with the fixed eddy on a position where um, two uh, streams um, rotate uh, the, the eddy rotates between two streams, or he uh, yes uh, walk over the oceans. Um, Currently, we uh, use the time, but we know that it's not the best uh, uncertainty um, if we know that the eddy uh, walk over the ocean. In this case, it's very good. Uh, we can see it in the Gulf of Aden. Um, and yeah. OK. Uh, so is it possible, uh, say, for two extreme cases of two ensemble members, like different eddies are overlapping, is it possible? Like, are you doing a correct correspondence or you could you do wrong correspondence? Like some other eddies are overlapping with some different eddies in- um, or... uh, uh, We checked uh, Abby in uh, one, yeah, first we, uh, the question is, uh, when we have uh, two examples, uh, we identify one eddy, the correct eddy in this sample, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yes, uh, we track the eddy and have an um, idea, uh, identify idea for this eddy. And so we can look, uh, have we uh, overlapping over more than 50% uh, in the most cases or default cases. And then we say this is the same eddy. And also we use this for the time uh, uncertainty or other uncertainties. So we can track the eddies also over the time or over the other uh, ensembles. Okay, okay, right. thanks. Yeah. And how do you pick the range of those parameters when you are computing uncertainty? Like, is it some educated guess or something coming from experts that you need to look at this range of values to compute uncertainties. Um, yes, uh, the range um, do means range from for the, um, the parameters values. Yeah, yeah, um, yes. This range is um, is um, more from the experts. So we have. I cannot uh, say what's uh, correct uh, boundary why we use it. So um, sorry for this. Um, okay. Yeah. 
All right. Uh, but anyway, a very nice talk and very nice work. So uh, that concludes this session. Let's thank Felix again. And So we have concluded the first session of Enverviz. We will have another session coming up shortly. There will be a short break. I think right now we'll be back at 11. So please let us thank all the speakers again, all the four speakers, very nice work. And also uh, I thank all our technicians, our student volunteer uh, for doing great job and helping us. So let's come back to the next session. Thank you.